What does it take to become an elite 40K player? How do the top competitors overcome bad dice? The Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War Unbroken. Insight into the game plans of the top players on the planet with your hosts, Blake Law and the Art of War Coaches. Hello and welcome to Art of War Unbroken. Champions may lose, but their spirits remain unbroken. I'm your host, Blake Law. This is the 53rd time you've heard me say this, and we are very happy you were able to join us today. They say we learn the most from our losses, and that is exactly what this show aims to do. We are interviewing an elite player who has lost one to two games at a major event. We're going to break down their mistakes. We're going to talk about how they plan to learn from those mistakes moving forward. How often have you blamed the game on bad dice? We all have done it. Brad Chester loves to do it all the time. He's doing it right now. He's literally blaming dice right now as we speak. He's rolling dice in the air. He's doing it all. He's blaming it. Well, our episode today, this is a guard episode. I know a lot of you guys out there have been waiting a very long time for this to come back around, so cherish this precious moment. We are headed to Man Crush Monday once again. It's time to talk a little IG versus Eldar action, where our guest met Mr. Nadavati for an epic showdown. Now, this is part one of the episode. So in this part, we're going to be analyzing the game. We're going to be talking about all the common mistakes, the secondaries, the target priority, and all of the things between A to Z. In part two, which is available to subscribers at theartofwar40k.com, after a after hours so we'll be talking about what our guest plans to do moving forward we're going to be talking about their strategies their list adjustments we're going to be talking about a little bit of everything it's the bradning it's the wild hour it's the after dark unbroken and make sure don't forget about the the thing the patented the very very special elite player mindset now my co-host today has taken so much energy from me in my intros for the past year that I've just given up. He's won a lot of stuff, Mr. Brad Chester. Yay! Brad loves Brad. Let's do this. Brad loves Brad. Brad, I didn't even do your intro today. That was just it. I am excited right now because you have so many options right now to introduce our guest today. And if you do not say a couple things, I'm going to be so disappointed. I'm not even telling you what. I'm just going to let you introduce him. Uh, and I'm just going to, I won't even be mad. I'll just be disappointed. I got a, I got something special in the works. Our guest today comes in at six foot four, two hundred and forty seven pounds. He once wrestled Sly Marble and ended in a stalemate. He's been a staple of the IG game since fourth edition and it was in the running for best in faction twenty twenty one ITC season. Mister Brett Urbanowski. Hey guys, how are y'all doing? Uh, still a little disappointed because we didn't say anything about how they make them bigger in Texas. Oh, how yeah. You, this, this golden opportunity. Yeah, your IG players are always bigger in Texas. Um, Brett, Brett, you're pretty huge, man. I was uh, I, I looked up some stats on you before <laughs> we started. Where, I mean, where is this going? <laughs> yeah, there's uh, you could look on uh, you could look online. He played uh, college football, so you can literally pull up Brett's like uh, height, weight, um, you know, all of his college statistical things. Where he went to high school, I could I could have gone a lot of different ways with this man. Got real creepy here. It's oh, like so actually, like, Blake's actually outside your door right now. <laughs> I am. I'm outside your yeah, door right now. I was amazed um, when you googled. I thought you were uh, the one subscriber to my my OnlyFans there for a second. Oh, <laughs> I'm watching. Um, I'm actually i've been i've been sneakily looking at your windows directly at your alt key i'm just watching that alt key all day man just focus laser focus focused on it just uh still trying in. to figure out if this is some sort of texas bullying that we don't understand yeah we're getting <laughs> hazed by brett right now he's uh did i say his name right i did yeah, yeah you said the name it's right. amazing slam dunk slam dunk baby i'm on a roll i'm on a hot streak you know like uh when you get a win streak on like hearthstone or something and it gives you more stars killing it right now i'm like i'm two i'm two in a row we're gonna keep it going we're Motor City Mayhem. Motor City Mayhem. We're talking about some IG, which I'm very excited about. It's been a hot minute. I think the last time we did it was talking about your buddy uh, Robert Moreland, who I know you play a lot of uh, a lot of games with. Y'all kind of springboard list off each other. So um, we're going back to Texas. I feel like Texas is the Imperial Guard state. It has to be. Oh yeah, I mean, there's what at least ten of us at almost any tournament. Best in faction for guard is not the uh, walking to Motor City Mayhem. I realize that the other guard player drops, and I'm like, okay, go talk to the judge. <laughs> like, hey, what do we do now? Because uh, I kind of already won the award. Um, but no, like any time, like at Dallas Open, it was basically down the last game between what me, Dirk, and uh, I believe William Ivy. It's 
been like that basically every single tournament. It's like, okay, who does the best out of me, Dirk, and Robert typically wins the, the award each year for the various tournaments here. But we have a really weird meta. I mean, we have a majority of the guard players probably feels like in the whole U.S. or down in Texas. We have a ton of night players. For whatever reason, we don't seem to have a whole bunch of demon players down here. So our meta's always very diverse, but always kind of weird and definitely competitive. I think, Brad, we had talked about that at Motor City, that it's sort of the same scenario that up in that Midwest circuit that really at any given day, there can always be one person that just blasts through to the top and you're like, okay, who's this person? And everybody else at the tournament's like, yeah, we know about this guy. He's a good player. It's just yeah, did the one have, thing right. You guys have a lot. The thing is like a couple of your guys just don't travel. You have a bunch of hitters. Same thing we have in the Midwest. You have some really, really good medium. I said the median's super high in the Midwest. I, I take pride in that. We have a lot of good guys we also have a lot of people that you're like oh man i might lose this game at any point I gotta get my mojo together yeah yeah the no, same thing down here i don't know uh do i qualify for midwest or am i the south where where do you put me brad you're somewhere in guam dude you're in arkansas i don't even know where you're supposed to be yeah you don't even know where i'm at i could be anywhere i could be outside of brett's window right now <laughs> let's talk about this list man uh tell us a little bit about this imperial guard list and I want you to know that I was desperately trying to avoid him all weekend. I did it. I couldn't do it with points because it was random, but my spirit was focused on not having a million of these indirect shots that we're about to hear about hit my poor Eldar in the face. You got that. You, you harness your Brad Mojo to make it to the top eight by avoiding this. We got it. Well, you know what? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, technically, we actually got paired up going to the last round, but I never fought the TO um, at the time that I had a flight that left. Uh, I think it was leaving at 925 and they ended up actually bumping around back the fourth round that day, 15 minutes later. So I was like, okay, if there's any chance in between round five and six for my opponent to get paired up quickly and start the game prematurely so we can finish it so I can actually make my flight back, I would really enjoy doing that. So he saw that I was uh, teamed up with Brad. I was excited about it because it was going to be, in my opinion, a quick table. <laughs> He was talking uh, mad shit to me all weekend. It was fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brad comes up to me at game one uh, playing CK, who's playing Tau, and he's look, sitting there next to me. All of a sudden, I look down, there's this guy about half my height making some, uh, some, some big people jokes. So didn't realize it was Brad until I really started to pay attention to the voice. And I was like, oh, oh crap, it's Brad Chester. I, I don't think you can say big people on the podcast. I'm about to edit that out. Big people. <laughs> <laughs> big people. <laughs> Big people jokes. Um, t run, run us through your list, man. I know everyone's dying to hear it. Um, so yeah, so I start with a, a battalion, um, gunner spotters, not running Katie. And I think that was the one big surprise out of a lot of people this weekend. And a couple of people that know me, that's kind of just my pride and joy. I guess I'm really comfortable with the way it plays. And I've been playing essentially this same list since the inception of ninth. Start with a company commander who's my warlord. Uh, nothing special there. Uh, tank commander with a demolisher. I'm um, actually had a hunter killer on him, but I pretty positive. I forgot to shoot that thing the entire tournament. <laughs> Um, five guard squads, all kitted the same. So five las guns, a melted gun for the special weapon that we now get for free, a box caster and a mortar uh, with a plasma pistol and a power sword on the captain. Um, and then a scion squad, plain old Jane scions. Don't think it was any big surprise. The amount of times that I've had people ask me about that squad in specific, oh, you have special weapons, you have anything crazy you can do with it? No, they're purely just going to be there for rod. So if you're trying to screen them out, you're either winning the game or you're losing the game very badly. Then in the elite slots, I have a Master of Ordnance uh, with Cure of Zaquila. Uh, so anytime that my opponent does a stratagem on the 5+, plus, I can get their CP back. Um, then three mana cores, two of which are full payload with a 100 kilo missile for that sweet flat 6 damage. If I, by some chance, get it to hit and wound on a, a Space Marine Chaplain on bike, that's always nice to kill a model with a 5-point upgrade. Then move into my second detachment, which is a Spearhead. Uh, same thing, Gunner Spotters now, because you have to be the same. Two Tank Commanders with Demolishers. Three guard squads, this time kitted with plasma gun, voxcaster, mortar, same thing on sergeants, plasma pistol, and power sword. A quad launcher, which is probably one of the biggest units I debated up until this tournament, but my buddy Robert Moreland loves those slug guns, so I was like, okay, I'll give it one shot, see how it goes. Three mortar heavy weapon squads for six mortars total, and then a regular Lehman Russ demolisher and to finish up that heavy support slot. That's a lot of pew pew. So you're raining down some indirect, and it's the good indirect still, because they left them, they left them at least that shred of hope, you know, like they they nerfed all the other indirect to oblivion. They're like, ah, guard can keep it's scary though, but I think it's actually scary, and I love I love the call of it right now in this though, because of the fact that so many people. People are going without transports, without, you know, they're bringing a lot of stuff on foot. There's a lot of trash units running around. It's it's a big deal to be heavy on indirect right now with it. Just still, you're getting the auto wounds on sixes because your guardsmen, it's just, it's a big deal. 
That's that is interesting. Oh, yeah. You know, you think about that meta shift because after Tau lost it, after um, Eldar lost the Night Spinner, like people are like a little more comfortable being like, "All right, I'm going to run 20 dudes just sitting out here at yep. P3." <clears throat> okay, cough, cough, Bradchester. Yeah, and I'm bringing even more on foot this week. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me tell you real quick. We played Nick, and we were playing. I think what was it? Mission? What mission were you guys playing? This? I think it was the scouring because it was. Probably the best mission he could have faced me on this whole weekend, to be honest. Ooh, that's not um, what I'm guard on scouring. That's not what you want to see right yeah. next to each other. Well, let me let me tell you real quick what Nick ran. So we've got <clears throat> two warlocks on foot. We actually have a total of four warlocks, two units of two warlocks on foot, two far seers, one walking, one jumping around with Kurno's bow, Mark of the Incomparable Hunter for the Mortal Wound Mojo. He ran a battalion, so he's got a guardian defender squad, two units of rangers. Two, three units of six dire avengers, a five man banshee with piercing strikes, nine swooping hawks, two vipers, a webway gate for shenanigans, Baroth, the third farseer, two units of three wind riders with shuriken catapults just to get in people's way, a big man block of nine wind riders with shuriken cannons, and a war walker with two shuriken cannons. What, what were you thinking going into this match? I know it's, it's definitely not a good mission for you, but how are you feeling? Uh, list on list when you saw this. So at Dallas Open, I played a similar enough Eldar list um, that I felt comfortable going into it. My biggest concern was the Webbay Gate because I'd heard stories about it, but I'd never faced one myself. Um, and once I had it explained to me what had happened and Nick reiterated it, that was definitely the oh crap moment um, because I realized immediately oh, you don't have four employers point, either. No. So I immediately realized oh. it gave him a lot of play into oh, that mission set huge because you can't do anything to stop it back so for everybody the webway gate itself is deployed in the deployment so if you have four deployers you can actually put some guys out but with it not being the case nick i'm assuming just slapped it directly in the middle and then could come out of that webway gate with his reserves and they go in for free so you could actually come out and any of his reserves that come out can actually start in combat you can't box them out they can come within the nine inch rule and just start in combat so that's a huge huge deal uh that he could basically put that in the middle on stranglehold which effectively means that he could be uh setting up and especially such a way with banshees and stuff like that that he could actually charge the brett's home objectives that's uh, dumpster fire for you. God, that is, you said the mission was bad for you. The mission is horrific for you. I apologize. You come out of, you come out of reserves and you're literally strangling. It's just like, ah, there we go. I was like, yeah. strangling. He can actually well, hit his home field at that point in time. Oof. Yeah. He didn't end up putting it in the middle, which I, I expected him to do that. I think the GW set up with the objectives kind of being there, uh, made, uh, where it was a little bit too close for him to place it. Um, he ended up putting it on the uh, left side of the table, which was still within touching distance as soon as he comes out of the two objectives. And then, okay, he advances one unit or does a move, and he's in the middle objective anyways. It's just crazy. Uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, so, bad for you for Stranglehold. I mean, you would have had wanted any, literally anything else uh, besides this, so that they're not all squished together and he couldn't come on top of you. So, all right, well, let's let's talk about the game itself. What what were you thinking when coming in, and what secondaries did you choose for this mission? So secondaries, um, I discussed, for me, my list doesn't have very many choices. Um, typically, like I had mentioned, it's going to take Rod, which automatically is limiting my points because most people expect you to be oh, trying to get 12. I'm perfectly fine getting eight. Um, I would love to get 12, but I understand that my list isn't made for it. I don't have the second unit of the Scions. Um, for the Emperor has been something I've really tried to get better at doing because anytime that I can have a secondary, I can achieve on my own it's always nice to have so i ended up going with that and i want to say instead of taking strangle which most people would probably do but against that list i realized it was not going to end well after turn three if i'd done so um i ended up taking grind assuming that i would at least be able to get nine or so points um with nick's list i had immediately realized he's going to take strangle um i had heard from my buddy he probably would take to the last, but seeing my list, Nick may not. Um, so if the, he took to the last, I think it was going to be the nine wind riders, the large squad of swooping hawks, and I forgot what the last one was. Me, I want to say it may have been bar off. It's bar off, where I'm mm -hmm. looking yeah. at it right now. <clears throat> so it would have been big bite. Yeah, so again, I, did he did he end up taking them? I can't imagine he took that. Again. No, he he didn't. He didn't. He took um, strangle. Mm -hmm. I think mental interrogate or uh, what, what's the uh, psychic ritual? Psychic ritual yeah. from the middle, yes. yeah. and I can't recall what the third one was. What is for the emperor? Is that is that the new IG it's the one? New IG one. Yeah. So you uh, so you it maxes up to three. Um, every unit that you kill a turn, you get a point. So it's essentially 
these, I believe, can't remember what the mission secondary is that has it as well. If you're playing guard, you're trying to kill people's units because if you're not killing people's units, you're not probably winning the game because they're definitely going to kill yours. So, I mean, it's something that I'm kind of used to not maxing my games. Uh, I've talked to a lot of my friends about this. There, a lot of people seem to really focus on how can I get 100 points or how can I get as close to 100 as possible. And me and Brad have shortly discussed about this. I don't care if I'm winning a game by 100 points as long as I'm winning. Because if I'm 6 no, <laughs> I'm in that cutoff. Doesn't matter if I have 50 points a game. But as a guard player, that's just hard to do. And I think that was after the weekend, I went back and looked at my averages for the tournament. I think it was like 85 or 86 points a game when the I think the eighth person cut off was like 94, 95. So it's just an inherent handicap. You had some big scores, though. You did. You mean, besides, you had the one loss here, which was still a very decently high score. You did really well in this tournament, too. Yeah, you really did. Yeah, I mean, a lot, well, a lot of it's just the, I won't say the list design. It, I, yes, I'm trying to table people as quickly as possible because really that's the if you're playing the long drawn out game with guard unless you're earning 300 conscripts you're probably not going to be able to hold on to your units as long as other people um so for me it's really i have two or three turns at any point in time against any list that if i can't do enough damage in those two or three turns i'm going to lose the game um we also down in texas have a lot of white scars and blood angels players and in that case yeah. i get a turn or two and that's it yeah they're on top of you right now so you do get a damage check really quick on that. Did yeah. you? Now you said you felt fairly comfortable with this. This. How did the game end up playing out in the first couple? Of times? I mean, this is a dumpster uh, mission for you, but I still think you you match up fairly well against this. Yeah. So so against this list, um, as I mentioned, against Dallas Open, well, I played a similar sort of list. I believe the guy had seven Wind Riders. He had the, the large swooping hawk unit. I think he had a. a a falcon with some howling banshees inside of it, so I kind of knew what he was going to do there. First turn, I basically got all but two of the swooping hawks killed. His all of his straight up his wind riders. His falcon comes in turn two, killed them. The howling banshees, the rest of the swooping hawks, and all of his rangers on the ground. So like there, it was a, essentially a turn two game going into turn three. Um, kind of expected the same sort of scenario against Nick, and I knew he was going to use the swooping hawks to come out, shoot, pick up the infantry squad, go back. The wind riders, I was afraid of him bringing them forward into my line. And basically trying to tag as much stuff as possible, just doing damage. Uh, he ended up doing that with the uh, Striking Scorpion HQ choice he had. He went straight up my line. I think turn two out of the Webway Gate was like turn one charge. Or turn one, he started on the line, uh, was able to advance up. And then I think turn two, he was able to charge into my line with like an 11-inch charge. It was something crazy. But yeah, I mean, with this with this game, my whole game plan was to try to hide as much stuff as possible. And I think that's where the, the comment earlier about not having the large GW pieces of terrain kind of hurt my list because Nick was able to hide everything inside of the the smaller boxes. However, myself, I think I had 40 or so infantry that were just out in the open. Like there's no chance for me hiding them unless they're on the back line, which then puts me at risk of if you tag into them, somehow you're tagging into my tanks because my tanks can't get away. Yeah. So I kind of had to just expect 20, 30 guys to get killed turn one, which really sucked, which ended up happening. And what made it even worse is that Nick got first turn, and I was really hoping to go first because I was hoping if I go first, I can kill the Swooping Hawks in this nine-man bike. Oh, that's, that's huge. Something I mean, that he, he told me he had not had a single one of those units die all tournament so far. So I was like, okay, he's probably played more games than that. I was like, if I can wipe both those units that he's used to having be to his, his to the last, mentally, his turn two game playing on, it's probably just totally out of whack because he's not used to okay the amount of damage that this list can potentially do big too because you're taking away 70 shots right there too well the swooping hawks are so tough to deal with though so you can literally just move them like a bazillion inches what is it like 18 or what is 14 but then you you bounce back infinite yeah you bounce back infinite so you literally could just pop out basically anywhere because they have a pretty decent shot like it's 40 yeah i mean it's just it's 40 shots for the the 10 minute squad right there yeah. So it's 40 squads plus the uh, 27 from the bikes. You know what I mean? It's it's That's a lot of shots where if he could have crippled that turn one, it actually means that there's just more bodies alive his turn one. And the other thing to think about with this list with first guard is, you know, the strands of fate dice. I mean, they make that list just move so quick with the advances of six or the charges of six. I mean, you're just looking at these crazy charges. Normally you'd be like, oh man, he's not going to make that, but. I mean, who knows when you have an auto six in either one of those categories. So out of this, he he kills a decent amount of guys, I'm assuming, first turn. Walk us through the game. Yeah, so turn one, he goes up. Um, he moves his war walker up into the middle. He moved the striking scorpion character uh, up as well. Um, and that's where it gets, I'm not sure if he was, it was a turn one, end of turn one charge, or if it was a turn two charge. I want to say it was turn one. I want to say that he had, he had 
there, he had a way that he was able to move him twice, or maybe he just inherently had pre-deploy in the neutral zone, and that's kind of how he got in my face so quick. Yeah, he he's uh, a forward deploying unit. Yeah, so yeah, it would have been the turn one charge, and like I said, he didn't use a fate dice on him. He he was being smart with his fate dice and keeping it for his psychic saves or his psychic test uh, to be able to go up, do warp ritual, and instantly get back into the buildings. So that way, he never had any risk of the character dying. And then also doing saves. I think he had three auto passes for his saves turn one, which was turned out nice. to be very annoying. It's huge. Yeah. But I mean, he, he moves up. He basically does the bare minimum, um, which is kind of what I, I expected. That's really any great player. You're going to be able to see them do just the bare minimum to win uh, and keep the score in their favor up until the point when they realize that they if they can go out and just kill enough stuff or if they at this point, the game's already far gone they can't really lose the game. So why don't they just kind of make it, I guess, a little bit more exciting at that point. But yeah, he moved up. He moves the swooping Hawks up, kills uh, 20 guardsmen, moves the bikes up onto dense terrain, kills another 20. Uh, that character ends up going and charging a regular demolisher that was behind um, a 10 man squad, but they ended up dying. If that was one of the very quirky things of if he had gotten wrapped around well enough, he could have gotten into another 10 man squad, a heavy weapon team, and then been on the edge of a thud gun, which doesn't have a movement characteristic. So if you tag it, I can't you, move. That's yeah, you, funny, can't, you can't emergency disembark it either. You can't auto destroy it because it just doesn't exist. Like that rule is not usable on that model. So it's a huge liability model um, for Lisk. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he didn't do very much. He did just enough to get his psychic ritual to get his stranglehold um, with the Warwalker. And then my turn one comes around and I have to make the big choice of how am I going to deal with the guy that's starting my back line. And I had moved up my moved my tank off. But just like a inch away, knowing that he's going to heroic inside, moved the tank commander over trying to block him because I asked Nick, I was like, hey, is there a way for them to kill these tanks? And he said, no, I realize that in this matchup, the demolishers aren't going to be doing very much. Um, it's really the infantry and the, the mortars. So I was hoping that I could deal with him kind of over there on the side quick enough, as well as Nick not push forward all of a sudden with his whole army, because if you did that, it might be in a bad spot pretty quick. I go to start shooting, kills Warwalk with the tank commander. That wasn't really a big question, but I shoot my 14 mortars, uh, one of which is hitting with plus one to hit and plus one to wound, and the thud gun all into swooping hawks, and I kill two out of like <laughs> the 40 or so saves that I tried to make Nick roll. I only got two through when I should have killed that unit twice. Uh, so you know, the better part was that he played Kelly, I think, the, the game afterwards to talk about things and he sent a screenshot. Uh, he made a, a big mess up and then made uh, 21 of 23 uh, four up in bones. <laughs> And in his two fails, by the way, were threes. So sometimes things happen. Jeez. Could, couldn't roll any of his psychic test the whole game outside of that one psychic ritual and uh, to get his character back. But he could surely make his saves. <laughs> um, yeah. I think I killed like five of the bikes, turn one as well, out of that nine-man bike squad. Um, and looking back, I definitely think I shouldn't have focused so much on the Swooping Hawks. I should have written once he, I believe, turn one, he did the... Um, the minus one to hit uh, strat on them, uh, okay, but it took them like, yeah, it took them a little while for it to for him to pop it. And then by then I was like, okay, I've already killed. I think I already killed two guys. And then I was like, okay, it's only a couple of guys left to make him fill his morale. And then he starts losing guys inherently. Um, I should have just moved on with the Rangers and other units. Um, I was just about to say, if you got, if you you have such the ability to kill trash, that that would have been a big deal, you know. Just say screw it and just go. Okay, well I'll pick up all your nonsense. Yeah, that's actually the biggest thing I was afraid uh, playing. Looking at your list was is the fact that you could kill my trash as fast as humanly possible. Right. Efficient and direct. And I think part of it was just the once he killed my, what, the 20 dudes with the swooping hawks. I was like, okay, if they keep coming out and killing 20 dudes every turn, I'm quickly not going to have any obsec units uh, out and about just because the way that the train was laid out is with the all the objectives being in the neutral zone, I had to go out and basically be completely visible to his swooping hawks at any point in time, as well as the bikes. Um because he didn't basically move up anything but those, uh, the War Walker, that Swooping Hawks that flew back, the Nine Man bike, and then that one character up. Um, I really expected him to move the other two bikes up as well and try to get angles on infantry squads, knowing that, yes, they're going to die, but they're going to take something out before they do some sort of uh, scenario. But then turn two comes around. He ends up bringing on uh, his 10 man Dire Avengers out of the way by gate that hold, go on to hold an objective. Um, his bikes move up behind them. Uh, he moves up a Viper to get onto the center for Strangle again, does a Psycho Ritual again. Swooping Hawks come out again, kill another uh, 15 guys. And basically, end up at that point for my shooting phase, realizing that I quickly wasn't going to have a lot of infantry left. Um, ended up killing his character in that. Next shooting phase, that Shrek and Scorpion character is in my line. Um, so I was a little glad about that. Kill his Viper that was in the middle. Um, 
killed, I think, all but one of the Dire Avengers that came out of the Webway Gate, as well as, at that point, I did kill the nine-man bike squad. And I think I fired the mortars at the Swooping Hawks again, but didn't do anything, uh, and started to move on to one of his Ranger units that ended up killing two or three guys. And then at that point, it was uh, his turn three. He kind of did the absolute bare move. Viper moves up, character moves up, psychic ritual move back. Because at that point, the status quo is his next turn. He can has, I believe, this five Dire Avengers or two five Dire Avenger squads and a five man squad of something else inside the Woodway Gate. And I was like, okay, if I move up at all, he can come out, move his full movement three inches away from that, another six inches, and then have like a five or six inch charge. Um, so he, he basically put me in the scenario of I had to react to him and really every option of that outside of hugging the opposite side of the board was utter crap. And that other side of the board is exactly where the swooping hawks kept coming out of. So it was a very tricky situation to be in. Um, and at that point, I, I ended up talking to him. I was like, hey, is this essentially what you're planning to do for the rest of the game? And he was like, yes. And I was like, oh, well, that's that's kind of crap because I don't at that point. <laughs> I have to kill everything that's inside of cover. Otherwise, the game, the game state from where it went to was just a, a loss. And that's kind of the, the scenario of due to the max of my score not being like really but 92 points or so puts me in a really crappy spot already starting in starting games with like a 10 point handicap um, in some mm-hmm. cases. Definitely, definitely credit to Nick. Uh, like I said, I think if we if we played on a different mission or yeah, the, the auto charges is just a huge thing for you. Yeah. Man. That's a, just oh, yeah. a big deal. I mean, you're, the, the mission for the scouring the there is no other mission where the objectives are so close. So that that's a huge deal because if you were playing like eleven or anything like that, where you're just super far away from each other, even a board corner, any you know any of the regular uh, five five objective missions that where they're not just squished together, uh, just because the webway gates letting it literally make charges right off deployment. Right, it takes away the effectiveness of a big like a ninety point chunk of his list. So that's a pretty uh. Uh, oh, I got all kinds of metal notes for uh, part two, the branding. So, but uh, what was your MVP of the weekend? And what oh, was God what's on the chopping block, um, Brett? What would you say? Um, well, over the weekend, I played uh, like I had mentioned earlier. I played CK playing Tau, and I think it was a two hammerhead long strike with a uh, some battle suit plasma missile pod bombs. I think they weren't running the the burst cannons, which is what I had seen before. Um, into a Custodes list that wasn't the standard like nine bikes, yada, yada, that everybody was running before the nerf and ended up doing pretty well into that. Ended up playing Nick next. Uh, day two, I played Harlequins twice, which was a very scary thought for me because Harlequins is one of those lists at any point in time, if they go first on the wrong map, it's like, I it, just lose the game. Yeah. So ended up going first the first time on Dawn of War, and then the last game I played them on Vanguard, and then ended up going second. Um, and that was a great game because going into like my turn, uh, bottom I one, I had killed a lot of stuff, and I was like, I could not see how he had the chance to get the game out. And he had doing some things that I did not see him doing. So that was a, a great opponent and a great game. Um, but play Custodes again on round five. But I mean, over the weekend, there are definitely some units that I am debating uh, on the on the chopping block. The side gun is definitely one of them. Um, I appreciate what they do and how they can play in certain matchups. Like if I was to play a 300 conscript list, they would be getting 24 shots every time, which would be great. But for 90 points versus you look at the 50 point mortar squads or free mortars now in this case uh, on the infantry and it's it just doesn't seem like it's a worthwhile exchange. Robert, it's, Robert's going to be very disappointed in you. Not you're... being able to fall back is just a big deal, though, because if you can get a weasel assault in there and just touch those guys, you just can't shoot. And I, I mean, I usually try to explain that to everybody every game. The counter to that is that if you're running three of them, you have nine gunners that technically in the rules say that you can't see them, touch them, use them for any measuring purposes, but they are put down purely for the fact that if you can't put all your units down, then you have a problem during your deployment. Um, but there's a way that you can wrap those nine bodies around those three thud guns and make them completely unchargeable. So it's probably the jankiest thing in the entire guard codex. And that's purely because of an eighth ed rule with forge world model. So, but the best unit that's probably, uh, probably the mortar, probably the mortars inside of the, the squads, to be honest, like I've been debating running mortars in my squads for before the upgrade came about, just because we were talking about thud guns down here in Texas so much. I was like, okay, but mortars for 10 points, if I spend 90 points on nine mortars, I'm getting 96 versus 46 on a thud gun for the same amount of points. Like, yeah, they're strength five or strength four versus five, but I'm getting more than double shots. Like that perfectly makes up for it. So now that we got the free upgrades, it really let me do 
the mortar spam and just kind of let me see how it operates. I think the, the guard not getting the nerf to indirect helps, but the mortars having D6 shots eats is also just with Hammer the Emperor is just the chance that if I'm rolling sixes for all of my shots and I'm getting a hundred and something shots off or 84 shots off in between my squads, that's a lot of auto wounds on average. That's true. Um, other than that, it's definitely, I mean, still the tank commanders, like they still do a ton of work, but that's where like with my list, not being Cadian, I have the 30 inch guns and I can reroll my shots. And the amount of times that that reroll um, for both my shots with the Lemon Rust or one D6 with the mana cores, I probably had some of the best rolling I've had shot wise at that tournament. Like I had one of my games, I got box cars twice with the mana core, um, <laughs> like right when I needed to get the shots off and it was just obscene. Those um, things are scary too. I mean, the the fact is is that they can really go off, so that is a big deal. That's me. That's me with lightning locks. Every time I every time I use lightning locks, I'm just like sixes, a million shots. Yeah, I mean the the true MVP. Now I'm now I'm thinking back to my games. Um, was actually all of my opponents. Round one against CK, he takes to the loss or to the last, which is his large battle suit squad. The major Tau commander, which I cannot remember the name of, um, and then just a regular Tau commander, but he. Puts his reserve, puts a hammerhead reserves. Not a bad mistake, but then he brings it on next to all these characters. It explodes. Turns out the hammerheads explode for D6 mortal wounds. Oh, yeah. So he exploded it. First unit, he does, I think, three wounds to a crew, six wounds to the uh, the major Tau named character, which puts him down to three, six wounds to the other character commander, which kills him, and then five wounds to the other battle suit, which basically gets him down to two models. Oh. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. And then um. the Quinn matchups, I've had probably 400 points of infantry that I didn't even have to kill because when they were blowing up their transports or rolling their ones to get out, they killed like 400, 500 points of models between the two Quinn players. Jeez. And then the I played a Custodius player, uh, I believe it was game five, that was running triple uh, Cladius, uh, triple Knights, or Dreadnoughts, and three by. Uh, ended up going first, and we knew we both talked about this because he knew at that point people had been talking about my list, and he kind of had done the research, and he was like, yeah, I realized this is a have-to-go-first-or-second matchup. He deployed, basically, he asked, is there anything he did wrong? And there really isn't anything because his studies takes take up so much space on the board. But I deployed most of my tanks like aggressively. I was like, okay, I have to go first because you have the movement just to see them no matter what I do. Ended up going first, blew up one of his tanks that did nothing. His second one, though, blew up, did wounds to his one Inquisitor that he had for mineral interrogation, did three wounds to, I believe, two of his dreadnoughts right next to it. His turn comes. He perils, blows up a Inquisitor, <laughs> does, and then blows up everything around him. <laughs> yes, and it does like like max mortal wounds to the dreadnoughts all around him. And at that point, he was like, "Yeah, dude, this like the game is done because I killed his three tanks. He basically lost fifteen points right there. His bikes were already dead. Like he he didn't have very much on the board. And I was sitting there talking with him. I was like, "We can keep going." But if we keep going, like, you're going to just not be able to be on the board, especially by, like, turn four or five. Like, it would just be a done deal. Um, but that, I felt that, that, that is your MVP. Like, I agree with you there. That Your MVP is your opponent's, uh, your opponent's uh, explosions. Themselves. They were so yeah. terrified of the guard. that they yeah. I've never seen more explosions in my life than <laughs> this last. They're, they're at Motor City. Like, that was a crazy amount of explosions. So, Brad, are you, uh, or Brett, sorry, are you ready for the Brad? The Brad Hour, the Bradning. Are you ready for the experience that's about to happen to you? Yeah, I think so. I think so. You're prepared. But dude, thanks for being on part one, man. I'm looking forward to talking to you in part two. And uh, Brad, you got anything else? I'm ready for the Bradning. Ready for the hour, man. All right. Make sure to join us for part two. Make sure to check out our other podcasts available at theartofwar40k.com. We have The Art of War Vanilla with Nick Nadavati and Paul Murphy. We have, of course, the very, very, very Australian Art of War Down Under with the late and great Adam Camilleri. We, of course, are the Art of War Pistachio, the flavor you didn't know you loved till you tried us. Thanks for listening. Join us for part three. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War and the Art of War Down Under podcast on the competitive 40K network, theartofwar40k.com. 